much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It is my distinct honor to participate today in this panel workshop on international marine environmental law in time of the triple planetary crisis. My topic today is about the IPLOS climate change advisory opinion uh, concerning uh, the impact of climate change and, and the ocean. I thank Professor Schiena di Pepe, Professor Kirchner, dear Lorenzo, dear Andre for your invitation. And it is a pleasure for me to be in this beautiful, impressive building of the Port Authority in Genoa. Don't expect a PowerPoint presentation. I will give you a very uh, classic lecture without uh, a PowerPoint. Climate change is internationally recognized as a common concern of humankind. The tribunal is conscious of the deleterious effects climate change has on the marine environment and the devastating consequences it has and will continue to have on small island states, considered among, among the most vulnerable to such impact. This was a significant statement made by the tribunal at the outset of its advisory opinion, which in my view paved the way for the important substantive conclusions it reached in response to the request submitted by the Commission of Small Island States on climate change in international law, which I will refer to as COSIS. This was the requesting entity. COSIS, I should explain, was created pursuant to uh, the agreement for the establishment of the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, which was concluded in October 2021. When the request was filed, Six states were parties to this agreement, Antigua and Barbuda, Tuvalu, the Republic of Palau, Niue, the Republic of Manawatu, and St. Lucia. Subsequently, after the filing of the request, three further states acceded to the agreement, namely St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Christopher, St. Kitts and Nevis, and the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Now, the request was filed in December 2022 and posed two following, the following two questions to the tribunal. I quote, what are the specific obligations of state parties to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, including under Part 12, one, First question, to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment in relation to the deleterious effects that result or are likely to result from climate change, including through ocean warming and sea level rise and ocean acidification, which are caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Second question, with the same chapeau, the obligations, what are the obligations to protect and preserve the marine environment in relation to climate change impacts, including ocean warming and sea level rise and ocean acidification. As you may know, the tribunal delivered its advisory opinion on 21st May of this year, a unanimous decision. This was already remarkable. The decision has been viewed by several commentators and have been many articles already written in press and articles as well. It has been viewed as a milestone in the development of the law of the sea in relation to climate change and the ocean. It's a long advice for opinion, 150 pages, so in my presentation I will only attempt to address some key aspects of it. But before doing so, I wish to touch upon the procedural challenges which the tribunal and the registry had to face when dealing with this causes request. The first procedural challenge was the need for the tribunal to deal with the causes request in an expeditious manner. I would like to point out in this regard that the request did not 
involved the requirement of urgency that is defined in Article 132 of the rules of the tribunal. However, when considering the issue of its discretionary power to render an advisory opinion, the tribunal noted that some participants had drawn attention to, I quote, the urgency of the threat of climate change to causes member states and also to, I quote again, the collective interest of state parties to the convention in emphasizing that there were compelling reasons for the tribunal to proceed expeditiously to answer the question, end of quote. It is that thus noteworthy that from a procedural point of view, the tribunal dealt with the causes request in a timely manner. The request was submitted in December 22, and the opinion was deliver, delivered in May 2024. Thus, the proceeding lasted approximately 17 months, and the advisory opinion was therefore delivered in a remarkable short period of time. This was made possibly by the fixing of adequate time limits, which were applied with flexibility. There was one round of written uh, statements and participants were afforded sufficient time at the hearing to make their oral statement. Another challenge the tribunal faced was the need to accommodate the participation of a large number of participants. As you know, these historic proceedings triggered wide participation from states, intergovernmental organizations, and the civil society. Written statements from 31 state parties and eight intergovernmental organizations were filed within the prescribed time limit. After the time limit fixed, further written statements were received from three state parties and one intergovernmental organization, but also several statements were submitted by NGOs. A public hearing was held from 11 to 25 September 2023, and delegations from 33 state parties and four intergovernmental organizations made oral statements during the hearing. The aforementioned flexible approach made it possible to accommodate the participation in the proceedings of an unprecedented number of states' parties and intergovernmental organizations without having to extend the duration of the proceedings. I will now turn to key aspects of the advisory opinion. A first aspect the role of science in laying the foundation stone for the tribunal's response. At the outset, I wish to underline the significant role that science plays in the Convention as a whole, in the law of the sea. Indeed, several provisions of the Convention refer to science, particular in the part addressed uh, by Andre, Part 12 of the Convention concerning the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Scientific aspects played indeed an important role in the advisory proceedings, and the advisory opinion makes uh, several references to science. Participants addressed at length scientific aspects relating to climate change and the ocean and submitted abundant materials on scientific issues. These abundant materials and submissions had to be somehow digested by the tribunal. That being said, in the current advisory proceedings, the scientific issues were actually not disputed, and therefore the task of the tribunal was, if I may say so, simply to determine the relevance of the scientific evidence and to reach its conclusions on that basis. For this purpose, the tribunal provided in a separate chapter at the outset of the opinion and as a background to the request, an overview of the science relating to climate change, 
and the impact on the oceans, referring to several reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. I would like to make a few comments in this regard. First, the co tribunal considered that sufficient information and evidence had been made available on which to base its findings. Second, the tribunal observed that most participants in the proceedings recognize those IPCC reports, I quote, as authoritative assessments of the scientific knowledge on climate change, end of quote. Third, the scientific words of the IPCC were found to be useful in several aspects of the advisory opinion. For instance, they were instrumental in defining terms such as climate change, ocean acidification, GHGs, uh, anthropogenic GHG emissions, as, as you know, they are not defined in UNCLOS. In addition, the tribunal drew upon scientific evidence in reaching its substantial legal findings. The first important legal findings, anthropogenic GHG emissions constitute marine pollution under UNCLOS. On the basis of science, this key conclusion reached by the tribunal was that anthropogenic GHG emissions into the atmosphere fall within the definition of pollution of the marine environment within the meaning of Article 1, Paragraph 1, Subparagraph 4 of the Convention. Following thorough examination, the tribunal found that anthropogenic GHGs are substances, that their emissions are produced by men, and that by introducing carbon dioxide, dioxide and heat energy into the marine environment, they cause climate change and ocean acidification, resulting in deleterious effect. The advisory opinion is the first of its kind in reaching such remarkable conclusion. And this paved the way to the further um, findings of the tribunal. Another important aspect, another important conclusion was that in the determination of necessary measures states have to take to prevent, reduce, and control marine pollution from anthropogenic GHG emissions, science undoubtedly plays an important role. This is because science is fundamental to understanding the causes, effects, and dynamics of such pollution, and thus to providing the effective response. The tribunal clarified, however, that this does not imply that science alone should determine the content of the necessary measures to take. There were other factors in the view of the tribunal that should be considered and weighed together with the best available science. However, the tribunal also made it clear that in determining necessary measures, scientific certainty was not required, and therefore, in the absence of such Certainty states must apply the precautionary approach in regulating marine pollution from anthropogenic GHGs. In addition, best available science informed several conclusions by the tribunal. With regard to climate change and ocean acidification, the tribunal stated that the best available science was found in the works of the IPCC which reflect the scientific consensus. The tribunal considered the global temperature goal and the timeline for emissions pathways set forth in the Paris Agreement to be particularly relevant. It stated that they were based upon the best available science. In this regard, the tribunal noted the dual temperature goal stipulated in the Paris Agreement of 2 degrees Celsius and 1.5 degrees Celsius, drawing attention also to the Sharp and Shake implementation plan, which states that, I quote, the impacts of climate change will be much lower 
at the temperature increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared with 2 degrees Celsius. Finally, the standard of due diligence. Scientific information was also a relevant factor in relation to determining the standard of due diligence. In this regard, the tribunal found that best available science informs that anthropogenic GHG emissions pose a high risk in terms of forcibility and severity of harm to the marine environment. The tribunal also found that there was a broad agreement within the scientific community that if global temperature increases exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius, severe consequences for the marine environment would ensure. In light of such information, the tribunal held that the standard of due diligence states must exercise in relation to marine pollution from anthropogenic GHG emissions needs to be stringent. A second key aspect was the tribunal approach to UNCLOS as a living instrument and its relationship with external rules addressing climate change. You know that UNCLOS does not explicitly address the issue of climate change and the ocean. It contains, however, a comprehensive section dealing with the protection and preservation of the marine environment, which is contained in Part 12. Thus, the tribunal has to address the question of the interpretation of the Convention and its relationship with other relevant rules of international law. In this regard, the advisory opinion highlighted the validity of the Convention as a living instrument and clarified its relationship with external rules. Indeed, the tribunal underlined that, I quote, coordination and harmonization between the Convention and external rules are important to clarify, end of quote, as well as it was important to ensure that the Convention serves as a living instrument. According to the tribunal, such relationship was particularly established so through certain provisions contained in Part 12 of the Convention, called Rules of Reference, which refer to external rules. The Tribunal was of the view that these provisions and external rules should, to the extent possible, be interpreted consistently. The Tribunal noted the extensive treaty regime addressing climate change, and I draw your attention in this regard to another chapter in the advisory opinion dealing with the relevant instruments in this regard. This treaty regime includes the UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, Annex 6 to MARPOL, Annex 16 to the Chicago Convention, and the Montreal Protocol, including the Kigali Amendment. The tribunal considered that in the case before it, relevant external rules may be found in particular in those agreements. May I ask you what we're doing with this? What? A third aspect was the tribunal's approach in defining or limiting the scope of the request for advisory opinion. In advisory proceedings in general, the tribunal can interpret the meaning of the questions put to it and define the scope of the request. And it is of significance important at the outset of the opinion to define the scope of the request to set the framework for the answers that will shape the entire decision. Before answering the uh, questions posed, the tribunal therefore uh, examined the request and um, it determined that it was asked to render an advisory opinion on specific obligations of states' parties under the uh, convention and that it could take account in interpreting the Convention the external rules I have already referred to. 
A number of specific issues were also clarified. First, questions of responsibility of liability. The tribunal concluded that it was confined uh, that it would deal only with primary obligations and not with uh, issues of responsibility and liability, but only to the extent and necessary to clarify the scope of the primary obligations. Sea level rise. Here, the tribunal considers that if the causes had intended to seek an advisory opinion on the consequences of sea level rise for base points, baselines, claims, rights, or entitlements to the maritime zones established under the Convention or maritime boundaries, it would have expressly formulated the request accordingly. So therefore, the tribunal did not deal with these matters in its responses. And um, finally, the relationship between the questions. The tribunal found that the obligations in the second question on the protection of the marine environment were broader than those addressed in the first question. So in the next couple of minutes, uh, I will focus on the specific obligations ident identified by the tribunal. On the first question, the tribunal found that the key provision was Article 194 of the Convention, and on the basis of its paragraph 1, it concluded that state parties to the Convention have, I quote, the specific obligations to take all necessary measures to prevent, reduce, and control marine pollution from anthropogenic GHG emissions and to endeavor to harmonize their policies in this connection. The tribunal further concluded that such measures should be determined objectively, taking into account inter, inter alia the best available science and relevant international rules and standard contained in climate change treaties, such as the UNFC C and the Paris agreement, in particular the global temperature goal of limiting the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and the timeline for emission pathways to achieve that goal. The tribunal made a number of clarifications in this regard. One, the scope and content of necessary measures made vary in relation to the means available to states, parties, and their capabilities. Second, the necessary measures to be taken include, in particular, those to reduce GHG emissions, and may reference in this regard to paragraph 3 of Article 194. Central to such measures is indeed the reduction of anthropogenic GHG emissions into the atmosphere. The tribunal, however, stated that the obligation to take necessary anti-pollution measures does not entail the immediate cessation of marine pollution from anthropogenic GHG emissions. The standard to be applied in taking the measures I already mentioned is due diligence, which is stringent. I will turn now, in light of the time, to the uh, second obligation in, in response to question one, namely that contained in paragraph two of Article 194, a provision applicable to a transboundary setting. The tribunal concluded that under this paragraph, states' parties have the specific obligation to take all measures necessary to ensure that anthropogenic GHG emissions under their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage by pollution to other states and their environment, and that pollution from such emissions under their jurisdiction or control does not spread beyond the areas where they exercise sovereign rights. In response to the first question, the tribunal also addresses obligations 
related to specific sources of pollution, considering that pollution from land-based sources, from vessels, and yeah. from or through the atmosphere were relevant in relation to marine pollution from anthropogenic GHG emissions. It considers uh, the obligation uh, to adopt national laws and regulations and establish international rules and standards in this regard, as well as the obligation to enforce national laws and regulations and implement international rules and standards. Other relevant obligations were addressed as well, namely those under Section 2, 3, and 4 of Part 12 of the Convention with regard to global and regional cooperation, technical assistance, and monitoring and environmental assessment. I turn now to the second question, in respect of which the Tribunal considered that Article 192 was the key provision. In response, the Tribunal considered that under this provision, states have the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment from climate change impacts and ocean acidification, and that where the marine environment has been degraded, this obligation may call for measures to restore marine habitats and ecosystem. Here as well, the uh, obligation was considered to be one of due diligence for which the standard is stringent as well. As the marine environment encompasses living resources and ecosystems, the tribunal focused its attention on specific obligations relating to the protection of rare ecosystems uh, under Article 194, Paragraph 5, and marine living resources under Articles 61 and 119 of the Convention, as well as the obligation under Article 196 concerning preventing pollution from the introduction of allied not indigenous species into the marine environment. This concludes uh, my uh, presentation on these key aspects of the advisory opinion. But before ending, I wish to observe that this decision adopted unanimously by the tribunal constitutes a landmark decision as it is the first of its kind in clarifying the nature, scope, and content of the specific obligations under UNCLOS to protect the marine environment in relation to climate change. And although advisory opinions in general have no legally binding effect, they contain authoritative statements on matters of law. These statements provide guidance, only guidance to states on the questions of the specific obligations they have on matters of the impact of climate change on the ocean. But it is, of course, now for states to consider this advisory opinion and reach their own conclusions. I thank you for your kind attention.